Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy and Agora Podcast Network member. We, of course, are on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can send me an email to steve at a2zhistorypage.com. You can also find more information if you're willing to donate or anything like that. You can go to a2zhistorypage.com. We also have our Amazon wish list if you're looking to maybe help me out by buying a book that's always really appreciated it's like my birthday and christmas all rolled up into one when i get one of those books it's really appreciated and it's a lot of fun but anyways for today we have episode 79 even more gregory the great I recorded this episode with Ben Jacobs of the Wittenberg to Westphalia, the Wars of the Reformation podcast, as a collaboration between our two shows because Gregory the Great is really a major force in both of our podcasts. He's obviously a huge deal in the history of the papacy, and he set the tone for really what would be the rest of the Middle Ages. So he's important for Ben's podcast as well. In today's episode, we talked about some of the important issues and events Gregory was involved with during his fascinating papacy. We will see the beginnings of the medieval and modern papacy right here. Exciting times are coming up in the history of the papacy and Christian church. Now, if you want to have some more about the context and background and history of Gregory the Great, I would suggest going back to episode 78 of the podcast, and you can listen to all of that and catch up on it. But these are really, in a way, standalone episodes. If you're really looking at some of the interpretation, you can just listen to this one, but why not get a whole view of Gregory the Great by listening to both. Uh, quickly, before we go, I thought I would mention the Agora Podcast Network shops. You can go to this website, which is Agora dash podcast dash network dash shop dot shopify dot com and this is the place where you can buy all sorts of t-shirts coffee mugs and other memorabilia from uh, many of your favorite agora podcast network shows i myself am in the process of setting up a shop and if you are really interested in history of the papacy mugs or something like that let me know and that will really help me uh, give me a big push to get the shop up and going the URL for the Agora shops is also in the show notes. So if you want to, if that was a little hard to hear, you can go into the show notes and it'll be there for you. Now, as always, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to listen. Don't forget to send in your ratings and reviews on iTunes. I really love to hear your feedback in any ways through iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or the email, and it helps to get the history of the papacy more noticed. I look forward to seeing you on the next stop on our trip through the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Um, as I said at the start, Gregory is one of only two popes known as the Great. Um, and we're definitely going to talk about how we feel about that label, but let's run through some of the uh, achievements that are attributed to him. Um, let's sort of go through uh, this sort of category by category. I think one of the big things people know him for is in the arts, um, but maybe that's not necessarily accurate. Uh, what do you have on that? One really big thing that's attached to Gregory is the Gregorian chant, which most people are probably familiar with. He probably had next to nothing to do with that. There was a form of, it was called Roman chant, mm -hmm. but everywhere had a specific singing style. The Byzantines had a singing style. The Middle East had a singing style. Spain had a singing style. Sure. Even Milan had a particular style of singing, which you'd probably, I, I can't tell the difference between <laughs> a lot of them. They sound very similar. Yeah. But uh, Gregor, the the Gregorian chant was a it was a standardization of a chanting style. I did an episode on this. If people really want the nitty gritty of the Gregorian chant, but basically there was no, at least in Western Europe, there was no way to 
write down how something is sung, like the melody of it. Right. And about 200-ish years after Gregory, a system was developed of at least getting the bare bones of how to sing. Right. So you could write that down and transfer it. And the person who invented that attributed it to Gregory without any really yeah. good reason to say why to was, attribute it to Gregory. So that was like the 700s. There was kind of a lot of that going around in the church, I have to yeah. say, at that point. Between then and around 1,000, there was a, the church is sort of notorious for well-intentioned or otherwise forgeries. <laughs> Um, it was but, created up in Frankish lands. Yeah. <laughs> and they put a better stamp, a better spin on it. Let's call it uh, Gregorian. He yeah, was great. Sure. Let's go with it. Um, so are there any other artistic works that are sort of worthy uh, achievements from Gregory's time that are worthy of note? Or is that, that the only one that people think of? Those were the big ones that I okay. know of. I don't think think i read anything specific about anything such as like uh, yeah. iconography or painting yeah. or anything like that so theologically um gregory is one of the powerhouses of the early church I i'd say or the medieval church um he's one of the first popes for whom we have a real body of work that survives by my count we have four major works um a large number of sermons and over 800 letters Amongst the major works is, and I should say that that's uh, not not that I went through the papal library and counted. That's from my sources. Um, but amongst the major works is a popular life of Saint Benedict, something that likely started building the reputation of Benedict's order in Rome, which would have importance later on, uh, as we talked about in my last episode. Um, but I think more importantly for our purposes going forward. Uh, there was the Book of Pastoral Rule. Can you tell us anything about that? That was one of the books that he wrote that really had a long-lasting influence, and that was a book detailing how bishops and priests should live and how they should basically do their job. It was a, a job manual for <clears throat> bishops. It had a lot of popularity. It was translated into... <clears throat> Excuse me. It was actually translated into Greek mm. and used widely in the Greek East. It was adopted in Spain. Much later, Alfred the Great had the book translated into Anglo-Saxon. Oh, yeah. So, so it had a lot of cachet throughout the whole um, that whole early uh, medieval time. Are there any interesting specific takeaways that you know off the top of your head? Uh, I'll probably get into this in a later episode, but uh, any specific rules that would be important? One that's interesting is that he enforced strict celibacy amongst the clergy, which was the West was always much more the rule was clerical celibacy, mm -hmm. but it wasn't very strictly enforced. There were bishops and I mean, obviously, Gregory had a great great grandfather. Yeah, right. Maybe there was a couple <laughs> more greats in there, but it, who was a pope. So obviously he had children and they were all legitimate. The Greek East and the Middle East was much more comfortable with married pope or married clergy they were all starting to get away from married bishops sure. at this point but married priests were still very common at that point so he's setting up the rule of clerical celibacy right there that was one of the ones that just struck out to me mm -hmm. but there's um the books are super long they're yeah. pretty easily accessible on the internet right, though, right. if somebody's dying to dig into that <laughs> it, it, i always up until I started getting into this specifically, I would always get confused because there's two uh, popes that are famous for doing a lot of reforms, both named Gregory. So I was never sure who to attribute the celibacy <laughs> thing to. But I, I think it's worth saying that his enthusiasm for monasticism probably had a pretty big role in how he fell down on some of these uh, these directives for the priests and the bishops. It's It's sort of like he took the directives that he wanted for monks and said, you should be a monk, even though you're living amongst the people and leading them kind of thing. 
Yeah, and that's another part of his monasticism was that, <clears throat> Gregory, I'm not exactly sure if it's in this book of pastoral care, but Gregory was one of the first popes to start separating the monastics from the local bishops. At, before that point, um, monasteries answered to whatever Episcopal see they were in. Hmm. So the bishop was always their boss. Gregory started giving them more independence where they didn't necessarily answer to the bishop of the geography their uh, monastery was in. Interesting. Located in. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. I had assumed that that was always the case. Uh, but, okay, that's good to know. Um, so are, were there any other theological works that were worthy of note? There's a few that are attributed to Gregory, but I don't necessarily know how much Gregory was directly involved with them. He may have been, but this may also be things that were attributed to him later. Sure. One is that he organized and reorganized the Roman liturgy or mass. I think they call it the pre-Tridentine mass. The Tridentine mass was the one used, I believe... 14, 1500s ish, it was reorganized and it was used pretty much until Vatican II. So that, okay, yeah. and there was a form of the Tridentine Mass which was used well before that into this time. I think they said that Gregory moved a piece here and moved a piece of it to over here, like um, where they say that our father, or where they say this part. It's possible that he did that and he probably would have had the authority and the respect to do something like that. But I feel that changes like that are more evolutionary than yeah. revolutionary. That's a, something like a liturgy like that's a very conservative document. Yeah, yeah. One other one that's interesting is there's something called the Liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified Gifts that supposedly Gregory wrote when he was in Constantinople. And that's something that's actually used in Eastern churches to this day. Oh, that's interesting. Which is not cool. used very often in the uh, Roman Catholic. It's still, it's a very minor part of it, but it's a of their practice, but it's a major part of Eastern practice. Huh. That's interesting. Okay. Um, and then I, I guess the, one of the other big things that he's known for is missionary work. Um, do you have, uh, I mean, there's some, some key stories that are associated with Gregory about this. The first one that we I, we spoke about a little earlier was that the Visigoths in Spain, their king uh, Recared, yeah, converted from Arianism to Catholicism, and that it was really Gregory's fault, or his <laughs> um, at least he was the one who got uh, the king to convert. I think that's probably there was a lot of other pressures on a Visigothic king to convert. So maybe there was a little tipping point there, but because Gregory was so great, but I think that that one is, that one's a little less clear. The big one is that Gregory is uh, given credit for re-Christianizing Britain right. when the Anglo-Saxons invaded in the mid 400s, early to mid 400s. The traditional telling is that. The whole island became pagan again, and it wasn't until the mid-500s with Gregory, who sent a big missionary expedition under Augustine of Canterbury. He wasn't Augustine of Canterbury yet. Right. And the story <laughs> is that in Rome, Gregory was in the slave market, and there was these blonde haired blue eyed children and he said something like you call them angles but i call them angels or something like that yeah it's probably not true <laughs> what they think that might be more likely to be true is that there were anglo-saxon slaves and that the church was going through these slave markets taking the children 
out of the slave markets, raising them Christian to be, become a core of missionaries that they would send later on. That's interesting. Yeah. He, the, the uh, Gregory did send 40 missionaries to, to Britain, but by that point, the kings in Anglo-Saxon England were much more willing to listen to Christianity. That was really the thing that they needed to do to plug themselves into continental trade and continental sure. relations is that they needed to be Christian. Right. You know, for economic if economic reasons, if for no, none other. Then you also had the Irish monks who were going into England at that time, who were probably doing a lot of the legwork. We'll see. That's another point that'll come up in later medieval history is the the conflict between the Anglo-Saxon church and the Irish church over a whole raft of practical Christian issues. Yeah, we, we talked about that a bit in the last episode. Um, you know, the... Celtic Christianity is sort of like inaccurate catch-all term. And then uh, an Irish monasticism was a huge influence up there. It, it fit really well into the the social order in uh, in Ireland and, and Scotland. And um, then you had the, the missionaries who were being sent by Gregory moving up from the south and the, uh, the fault lines built up in sort of Northumbria and that, that kind of area. I even think that in... England, it's much more accurate to say that it was more of a situation like in Spain, where you have a ruling elite. Yeah. And like the Christianity was still there. It wasn't just wasn't well organized as it was because Christianity was still pretty light on the ground, even amongst the native populations, the holdovers from the Roman Empire. That was not one of the densest christian populations yeah and it's plausible that the the leaders the people who would have been the natural leaders of the the christian uh society in the british isles sort of fled they were the ones who had the money to to mm-hmm. leave and, and all urban life collapsed so there wasn't a natural way to organize them but at the same time, it's it's kind of we know now that there wasn't some kind of genocide. Yeah, <laughs> the the lower classes were definitely British, even after the Anglo Anglo Saxons took over. But um, speaking of uh, the the economy and slavery, um, one of the big ongoing debates about Gregory has revolved around his relationship with the Jews, and I think. Uh, this actually gets into the issue of these massive slave markets in Italy. Uh, it's just an interesting bit of background to give before we get into the Jewish issue. Um, trade in the Mediterranean had, and you know the whole former Roman world had kind of collapsed. Uh, and one of the few commodities that was still moving was actually slaves, um, which gets into some of the, the background for what we're about to talk about here. Um, there, you know, Jews in medieval society, uh, it's going to be a whole episode at some point in the future, but for now, um, we actually have a lot of material about Gregory and the Jewish communities in Italy. And it turns out that they were actually some large and prosperous Jewish communities, um, which Christian doctrine was struggling to figure out how to deal with, um, even you know centuries beforehand, the there there had been this ongoing struggle to figure out how 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 to relate to the Jews because they weren't pagans, but they were this competing ideology essentially that rejected Christianity very explicitly at the by this point. Um, one of the big guiding lights it, theologically had been Saint Augustine's doctrine of the witness people. Uh, which, again, we're going to go into a lot more detail, but basically St. Augustine said that it was important that the Jews survive so that they could witness how right Christianity was <laughs> and that, that you know, so we couldn't kill or forcibly convert the Jews. We, I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't convert, kill or forcibly convert the Jews, but um, they also shouldn't be nice to them (laughs) in any way that they they just had to be there as sort of a token enemy 
of Christianity to observe the glorious success of Christianity up to the end. Um, so in this, this context, I mean, that's, that's a pretty, um, you know, it's nice that he wasn't saying to wipe them out, but, uh, that's a pretty rough theology to be honest. Um, and that was sort of the main doctrine, even of Roman legal tradition, uh, up to Gregory's time. So what, what can we say about, uh, Gregory's record here? I think it's important to keep in mind that later ideas on anti-Semitism get kind of built on to the foundation of this point. Someone like Augustine and these earlier writers who were writing polemics against the Jews, you have to remember it's not until maybe the five, six hundreds where clear lines are being drawn between what's a Jew and what's a Christian. There's still Christians at this point who are celebrating the Easter feast on the 14th or 15th of Nisan. Right. Passover. <laughs> yeah, on Passover. So whether it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday or whatever, that's when they're celebrating Easter. And the bishops are having a big uh, fit about that. There's Christians who are going to <clears throat> synagogue on Saturday and then going to church on Sunday because there's, like you said, they're seeing that there's some sort of mojo that the Jews have mm -hmm. and there's, um, that they're seeing that there's a, they have something going on religiously. So the lines are not clearly, I mean, even, um, <clears throat> with, uh, the pagan religions, the popes, in the 500s are having a fit because at the end of the Easter celebration, the people are going out to take a look at the rising sun and doing like Sol Invictus stuff. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there's uh, the lines are still really blurred. They're getting less blurred at this time. Like what we would really call like real anti-Semitism is more of a function of like the, 10th and 11th century where these are the jews they're a different religion we know they're a separate religion like everybody's on the same page that we're all separate relig religions and we're going to kill them specifically for that right that's that's later yeah that's coming down the line Yeah, the, one of the the big things that I'm, I'm going to be talking about later, but there's been a very uh, – since the Holocaust, obviously, there's been this attempt to understand the origins of anti-Semitism. And that leads to some errors in terms of looking at history in terms of – of leading inevitably towards the Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, it, it's not like St. Augustine, when he was writing about the, uh, the witness people doctrine, he was going, I'm planting the seeds that are going to lead to the gas chambers. Yeah. It, it, it was a series of steps taken for purposes that were very local and of their time and place. And certainly they built on each other, over time, but, you know, we're, as human beings, we have a very limited ability to think in millennial terms, you know, thousands of years down the line. So, um, and, and that's really what we're talking about, things that, these little doctrinal decisions that built on each other over the course of tens of centuries, but with that said, uh, you know, and that, that back background understood. Sorry? Back to Gregory. <laughs> back to Gregory. Um, what was his relationship with the Jews? Because it's kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, it's interesting. Gregory, he was certainly no fan of Jews, and he didn't want uh, people who were already Christian becoming Jews. But he also, it was not uncommon in certain places for synagogues to be attacked and he was completely against that if a synagogue was attacked he's on record saying that the the people needed recompense for their 
damaged property. I right. think he didn't want he didn't want Jews getting special treatment, but he wanted them being treated with. He said that they should be treated within the law. Uh, there's just a short quote. He said, this is Gregory, just as no freedom may be granted to the Jews and our communities to exceed the limits legally set for them. So they should in no way suffer through a violation of their rights. That was a common phrasing that would be used by popes later whenever they wrote about or wrote official doctrines about the Jews. Yeah, my my reading is that that's more or less the official doctrine of the church in, in general, mm-hmm. um, accepting a couple crazy uh, priests out in the countryside who weren't really properly educated. And then whatever it was that happened in Spain, which we'll talk about eventually yeah. with the Inquisition there. But the, the main thrust of the church was we follow Roman law and Roman law says create the special place, the special basket for the Jews to sit in. And that's where they're supposed to sit. And you don't mess with that basket, but they also don't get out of that basket. (laughs) Gregory, he, um, he was totally against uh, using physical means to convert Jews to Christianity. That was, that was happening at that point in certain areas where, um, you know, people would literally have their arms twisted to become, to convert to Christianity, but he was not against using financial or tax breaks or that sort of thing to get people to convert, which was really not outside of the norm of how the Abrahamic religions would operate in the era, you know, in the Middle East, mid, yeah. <laughs> medieval area. I mean, that was part of the dimmy uh, amongst Islam. It was just, there was a financial right. benefit to join Islam. Right. So Gregory didn't have a problem with that. What's, what's interesting in one of my sources, which is uh, Kevin Madigan, the, the medieval uh, oh, that's a great book. Yeah, that, it is. Uh, Medieval Christianity and New History. It's one of my main sources. Um, it's actually got an audiobook version for anyone who wants to go through that. It's it's great. Um, one of the things he says is that despite all the things that Gregory said about sort of keeping the Jews in their basket and not letting them get out, is that he actually, of all the popes, possibly went more out of his way than anyone else to actually give Jews special protection and benefits, uh, possibly beyond what was required by Roman law, going so far as to actually, you know, um, pick fights with Byzantine emissaries to, to protect Jewish interests. Um, he doesn't say anything about this, but one of the things I wonder about is uh, because the Jews were such an important part of the economic community of Italy at the time. And because Italy was so economically moribund, (laughs) whether that wasn't, uh, you know, at least somewhat a, um, you know, rational policy decision, essentially, to be like, uh, at least someone's trading, we need to protect these people. Gregory, one thing that he did do was that he said that Jews who owned Christian slaves could not own Christian slaves, that they would lose that property. Right. So I guess you could call that a form of anti-Semitism, that they weren't, that they were being denied a property right, but then they was freeing slaves. So you kind of like, you know, it's yeah. hard to take yeah, a strong like... moral take on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was a big thing throughout it wasn't just something that they were, the church was imposing on Jews at that point either. They they were coming. It it wasn't, they, they, it wasn't as strong a doctrine as that it would be later, but the church gradually came down on the concept of owning Christian slaves. Uh, It was not generally acceptable. (laughs) Um, You know, uh, I think at this point it was more acceptable, especially given the economic importance of the slave tra- slave trade in Italy. But um, it was certainly something that the church kind of looked askance on when, like, the the Catholic Franks would raid an area and take mm-hmm. Catholic slaves. They're like, you, you, yeah, are you serious. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll get into this later. Slavery had in large part gone away as an institution in the medieval period. It really was really in the early modern period. 
it was in the uptake. I read a book, Those Terrible Middle Ages by uh, French Perrault, yeah. I think her name is. And she wrote that mm-hmm. it was um, with the African slave trade and the um, enslavement of uh, yeah. native people throughout the colonialized areas that slavery really skyrocketed. It, yeah, the, there's some low key debate about this, but basically the the consensus is roughly that in most places in Europe, the there there had been these big slave plantations in the Roman world, uh, and the the numerous plagues that went through and the the starvation and the social dislocation meant that there wasn't a new source of slaves coming in really, uh, and so this you needed to work harder to protect those slaves. So the status of the slaves actually rose. They gained a lot of rights, a lot of protections. Uh, although their status was frozen, manumitting them became nearly impossible, but they, their status rose. Uh, they became tied permanently to land. But then at the same time, uh, as political rights for the population in general like went away in, in the face of all these attacks, the status of normal poor people, free persons, dropped. And serfdom in the Middle Ages essentially became this uh, – and I'm going to get into this more in later episodes. It wasn't quite this simple, but you sort of mushed together uh, poor farmers and slaves into the serf class. Um at the same time, in the early Middle Ages, slavery was still very much a thing, um, and the slave trade was very active. It's just that the economic collapse of the West meant that the slavery was all going in one direction, mm-hmm. and that was East. Uh, Europe was a source of slaves uh, for the, the Avars, the Hungarians, the Saracens, the Vikings. They would capture these slaves and move them East uh, there was one. There were a couple really big routes. One of them was for the Vikings through the Baltic, uh, and then down to Byzantium that way. Uh, Byzantium and the, the Caliphate um, through Russia, and then the other big route was overland, sort of through Central Europe along the Danube, uh, and then overland through Kiev. And it's interesting. One of the main uh, f- founding reasons for Kiev to exist was that it was a crossing point for a couple of these slave trading routes. Um, and that's sort of uh, a big part of behind its early prosperity. Uh, same thing for a couple of the cities in England. Uh, the the slaver, slaving in Ireland would then take people through England and off to the Baltic and stuff like that. Uh, so slavery was definitely still a thing, um, but it, it wasn't something that was practiced on local populations. Um, and, uh, you know, Christian slaves were being taken by people in Europe. Um, and and I, I should say that as much as the church frowned on it, like the Franks were definitely taking slaves. They would just sell them on to Scandinavians <laughs> who could get away with it, uh, which is a, <laughs> it says a lot about it's how the Vikings knew that, how to attack, that they were trading uh trading with the Scandinavians. Uh, so the Scandinavians were very aware of what the political situation was in uh, Charlemagne's empire. Anyway, back to Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've run through, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that people attribute to him and that people attribute to what makes him the great. And just to sort of put a bow on it, um, the, the standard story is that Gregory is sort of the origins of the imperial papacy. That he he had a couple writings where he talked about how um, the the pope should be in control, that it should be the head of the church. Uh, he did a lot to gain the political goodwill of people, um, definitely in Rome, but then people the word spread. So it, you know, all through Italy, uh, people were moving their loyalty to the church. Uh, especially as bishops in other cities did similar things uh, to the almsgiving that he did in Rome. And this sort of began uh, the the power base of the papacy that it would grow later on. Um, what do we think about that sort of narrative? I think looking backwards, it's very easily uh, it's, we're very easily able to set that narrative. I think it was foisted upon Gregory 
Previous to Gregory, the popes were in a brutal fight with Constantinople of who's going to be the theological boss of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Rome always... You have to look at this point. That's probably, we're getting into the low watermark of where Rome had theological power, even in their own territory. Right. So the Rome is trying to fight to get that power back, plus the power that they felt that they had over the universal church, all of Christendom. Right. The temporal power is getting forced onto the Pope at this point. Yeah, yeah. So the popes are getting these two powers. They're becoming a power in the in the secular area, and they're fighting to get this power in the religious area. That's going to grow throughout the whole Middle Ages into the modern period. There, there's going to be stepping stones to developing those both of the powers. So we can, you know, I guess we can kind of see that the seeds were planted in this point, not necessarily with Gregory, yeah. but that the popes are going to get the, a unique position where they have a lot of civil power and they're going to have a lot of religious power. Yeah. It's, it's like you said, it's like seeds being planted. Uh, and sort of this, this ties back to the anti-Semitism discussion really, because it's easy to impose this narrative backwards based on what we knew it was going to happen. And it, Gregory probably, despite he he made some statements about how the Pope should be in control of everything, blah blah blah. But you know, I, I doubt that he was when he appointed the cardinals to distribute alms to the poor people. He was thinking this is going to be the basis of the way the Pope is elected in a more streamlined fashion in several centuries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I've always struggled with the question. Was the medieval pope in the papal lands a theocrat? Was that a theocracy? And some sometimes I'm like completely yes, and sometimes I'm completely no. And I think that that's the dichotomy. Yeah. The pope of the Middle Ages was two offices mashed together yeah. that were separate, though. There was like a separation of church and state within one person. Yeah, it's like they would take off hats and stuff and behave in completely different yeah. manners. Uh, you know, the the in some ways, the 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 church and the state were blended in that whole survival of the Kaiser of papism and sort of doctrine of the Davidic king kingship where uh, the the king is supposed to look after the moral health of the church and the church is supposed to be the spiritual guide of the people. Um, th that whole way of looking at things was definitely a thing in the Middle Ages, but it was also clear that what was needed to be a successful ruler in the Middle Ages was so different from what Christian doctrine was that even when you had rulers who were also church officials, they would, you know, expound Christian doctrine that was so completely different from the way that they behaved um, <laughs> as rulers. And it's easy to say, call that hypocrisy, but it's, it's al almost like they were just fulfilling different social functions, you know, taking off yeah. one hat and putting another one on. Um, and that may just be what was necessary <laughs> at the time. For everything, too, with the popes of wanting secular and for accumulating secular power, for quite a while after Gregory, a pope still needed the seal of approval of the Byzantine emperor. Right. That would get transferred over to the holy roman emperor yeah. and that lasted for hundreds of years that the pope had to be <clears throat> officially stamped uh, would need the official stamp of approval of the holy roman emperor for his religious authority yeah and effectively for his uh, uh secular authority as well yeah definitely and that's going to be something that I'm going to be talking about that process is, is going to be something I'm going to be addressing in the next couple of episodes. Cause you know, as you probably gathered from the title, the tale of two Gregory's, the next thing I'm going to be talking about is Gregory the seventh. Um, and that leads right into the investiture controversy and everything around that. Um, so, and the struggle over, you know, sort of the independence of the church versus the independence of, of the empire and, and secular rulers. 
this is why I needed to go back to Gregory. <laughs> this yeah. is the first. And this is all things that are developing over the course of like a millennium. Yeah. I mean, Gregory the seventh uh, is, oh man, I completely forget when he ruled. Um, yeah. I mean, Gregory the seventh began his papacy in 1073. So we're talking like 500 years later. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an in, inconsequential amount of time. Uh, the whole situation was very, very different in many ways. So I think that brings us, that sort of covers everything we definitely wanted to cover. Um, just like to thank you very much for coming on and, and helping us get through all this. Uh, this has been great. Oh, thank you. I hope I didn't um, go off on uh, tangents too much. It's just, it's so awesome. And there's so many things that all come together. Definitely. I mean, that's, that's why I needed to cover it. And these were, a lot of these were tangents that I've wanted to cover too. So um, where can, uh, where can people find out about your show? You can find all of the social media and where to subscribe and iTunes and all that at my website, a2zhistorypage.com. Great. Awesome. And um, of course, if you're listening to this show, you've heard me say it a billion times, but uh, my website is Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast.weebly.com. And again, you can get to the Facebook page and Twitter from there. You can email me. Um, please listen to all of our show, both of our shows and review us on iTunes. And um, uh, thanks everybody for listening.